Lord has done great things for us, and we are glad indeed. Amen. In my mid-20s, I spent a couple of years in San Francisco. And during the day, I would wear all my professional clothes with my 80s shoulder pads and my high heels while working for a securities firm in downtown San Francisco. But in the evenings, I would change into all black, sort of casual, cool, hip clothes, and I'd sit in cafes on Haight Street, feeling very avant-garde. My clothes and image were a way for me at that age to try on different identities, to figure out who am I? Today's gospel reading is also about identity. John the Baptist is baptizing and proclaiming the coming Messiah. The temple officials in Jerusalem, however, are concerned. The crowds John is drawing indicate an authority and influence in competition with their own. So the temple sends some representatives to John to question his identity. Who are you, they ask. Are you the Messiah? No, says John, I am not the Messiah. They ask, are you Elijah? No, he says, I'm, I'm not Elijah. They ask, are you the prophet? No, he says, I am not the prophet. Then who are you? The question of identity is an important one to all of us. Who are you? How each of us want answers that has implications for what we believe and how we live our life. We have all different kinds of identities. As a child in your family, were you the smart one, the pretty one, the athletic one, the funny one? As an adult in your office, are you the responsible one, the creative one, the ne'er-do-well, the best boss ever? At home, are you the alcoholic dad, the competent wife, the star student son, the loser sister-in-law? Each role has different expectations to live into. But is that who we really are at our core? These sorts of Small identities are what the theologian and mystic Richard Rohr calls the false self. Things like your body image, your job, your education, your clothes, your money, your car, your success, and so on. These are not bad per se, but they are an illusion and prevent us from getting to our true self. Rohr writes, your false self is not bad or wrong. It's just mortal. It is relative and not absolute. It is passing and not substantial. A largely mental and cultural construct. It will die when you die. It is an incomplete self which is helpful during the first half of life to get us started, but it's not who we truly are. For instance, this time of year, all of us are being told our identity is as consumer. Our desire to buy and give gifts at Christmas may come, may come out of a true self place of generosity. But if we identify too much with our false self as consumer, our desire may in fact instead be coming out of a place of shame, of keeping up with the Joneses or, or of insecurity of needing to be loved. So it is not the action itself which is telling who we are, but the motivation. Out of which identity are you operating? Which brings life and which brings heartbreak? In the words of Oscar Wilde, be yourself, everyone else is already taken. But what is our true self? Rohr says it's often referred to as our soul, that which is eternal. But it's more accurately understood as larger than that. 
Our true self includes soul, spirit, and body. He defines the soul as who you are in God and who God is in you. It is eternal, and it is both connected to God as well as unique to you. It is where we are joined with God. That's the soul. The spirit is the eternal breath that was given to us at our creation. And the body is a gift from God where we embody love and the good news in this life. Interestingly, these three components are found in our reading today from 1 Thessalonians, where it says, Rejoice always. May the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely. May your spirit and soul and body be kept sound. All three components. First Thessalonians defines our entirety, our true identity, our true self as soul, spirit, and body. It is through an understanding of our true self that we gain an understanding of God. We come to embrace that we are at our core loved by and precious to God. And so too is everyone else. When that truth becomes an integral part of us, everything changes. Rohr writes, if we could tr fully trust this, it would change our whole life agenda. This discovery will not create overstated or presumptuous individuals as religion usually fears, but instead makes all posturing and pretending largely unnecessary. Our core anxiety that we are not good enough is resolved from the beginning, and we can stop all of our climbing, contending, criticizing, and competing, all accessorizing of any small, fragile self, henceforth shows itself to be a massive waste of time and energy. But our false self must die in order for our true self to live. Jesus says throughout the Gospels that we must lose our life to save it. We must lose what is temporary to gain what is eternal. Our false identity must die in order for us to see our true identity. But we're so used to clinging to our false self. We don't want to let it go. It gives us comfort. We hang on to it because it seems like the thing that's most real. We're blinded into believing that it's real. That's why it must die. But this death allows for the resurrection, our conscious recognition of our true self, the, the bringing about of which is the true role of religion. Rohr says, quote, this change of identity is the major, almost seismic shift in motivation and consciousness itself that mature religion rightly calls conversion. It is the very heart of all religious transformation. Without it, religion is mostly a mere belonging system or mere belief system, but it does not radically change your consciousness or motivation. So what he's saying here is true mature religion, according to Rohr, is not about morality or belief, but about a change of identity and consciousness, which transforms us. I'm gonna say it again, because it's so key. True mature religion, according to Rohr, is not about morality or belief, but about a change of identity and consciousness, which transforms us. So when the temple authorities ask John the Baptist his identity, note that he doesn't identify himself as being the guy who wears camel hair and eats locusts and wild honey. That is a false self identity. He doesn't identify himself as being the son of Elizabeth and Zechariah. He doesn't even identify himself as being a morally superior prophet. Rather, John identifies himself as the proclaimer of Jesus. He doesn't get caught up in his false self and those temporary labels. 
but recognizes that his true self, his soul, spirit, and body, body is bound up in God and what God is about to do in the world. John identifies his true self to the authorities, which is to point to Jesus. He knows already that every aspect of his being is loved by and belongs to God. The authorities can do nothing to him. John is already in heaven. I had a former hairdresser who enjoyed discussing eternity and the cosmos and karma and tarot cards and consciousness. She used to bring out her tarot cards for me every time I came in. One day she said to me, we all just need to wake up. The world needs to wake up to reality and then all will be as it should. And that is what Advent is about, to wake up, to be prepared for the bridegroom, to wake up to our true selves, to wake up to our identity as the beloved children of God. Our false identities may be doing whatever it is they're doing, but God loves who we are at our core. And to allow the, we need to allow the death of our false selves while we wake up to resurrection and our true selves. That was John's message. Wake up. So I ask you, in light of all of this, who is your true self? Amen. <laughs>